Hey everyone, I'm Tim Sinova, and welcome to Work Shouldn't Suck Live, the morning-ish show. Today is part two of our special episodes, and it is going to be another amazing one. Um, we have three uh, terrific, amazing, wonderful people t joining us. But first, Lauren, I see a new hat, and yeah. what did you do over the weekend? Uh, this weekend was a blur. I think I reviewed some grant applications Got a good bike ride in, some gardening. It was really basic. How about you? How's how's being out in New York? Uh, I stared at a couple of trees for a little while and off into the distance. So um, all <laughs> in all, uh, I would say it, it, it was it was it was nice. So um, cool. I, I was really getting excited for this episode this morning. Uh, we have uh, three amazing guests. We have one return guest from from our season one, uh, Ashara uh, Akundayo. Uh, Esteban Kelly and Cyrus Marcus Ware is joining us after our conversation on Friday with Oscar and Vanessa. Oh, God, this is going to mm -hmm. be amazing. So without further ado, uh, welcome to the show, Ashara, Esteban, and Cyrus. Hey, how's it going? Hey, morning. Hi, morning. <laughs> um, so it is, it's good to see all of your faces. Um, I'm going to kick it off with the question that we've been asking people just to check in. Um, which is, you know, how, how are you uh, doing right now? We've got um, a pandemic happening in addition to, um, it's not even a resurgence because the sort of movement for Black Lives never went away. Um, however, it's, we've been thrust back into the forefront. So um, really curious just to check in and see how, how are y'all doing? Whoever wants to go first, it's hard to navigate on the screen. I'll go first. Um, my name is Ashara Ekondayo, and I'm really clear that it is morning. It's not morning. <laughs> it's it's heck of early for me. Mm -hmm. uh, how am I? I'm living right now on Oakland, the land called Oakland, California, which is the unceded land of the Ranso Maloney Nation here in Northern California. So, uh, you know, we've been in the streets all weekend. When I think about how am I, I'm... I'm rejuvenated and exhausted and uh, still angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still mad about, you know, the level of injustice that we're taking in right now and consuming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, they're so inspired, you know, by the artist and the creativity and the brilliance of Black people right now. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Are you about next? Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm Esteban, and I'm um, based in Philadelphia on uh, the Lenape people's land. And um, I feel I've been yo-yoing a lot the last week, um, not even cyclically within a given day, but really. Um, just at any point, I can go from really feeling really uh, hopeful and inspired, and um, and and called to to action or or to belief in a possibility that things can really change, and and other moments really sitting with grief, um, for exactly those reasons that you were starting to say that there's this layering of all the different things that um, that we're living through, and it's not it's not coincidental, right? Like that that some of those conditions are agitating and exacerbating. Uh, or heightening um, the intensity of, of some of the other ones, particularly as experienced by Black people, um, not just in Philadelphia or in the U.S., but around the world. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think where I land is, I think today I feel pretty good. I'm feeling very connected to my people all over the world, um, by which I mean, my very close friends who happen to be a, a mini diaspora themselves, but also to black people um, all over the world and to that diaspora. And just seeing like as far away as New Zealand um, and in, uh, in Bristol and in Berlin and in just all over in Sao Paulo, um, where, I, where a part of my diaspora community is um, of, of friends, um, just seeing how many people 
are leaning into this question of what it means to love black people and to show up for us and to reckon with the conditions of how we're treated, not just voyeuristically in Minneapolis, but black people are everywhere and we are suffering um, in similar ways all over the world. Um, so I'm just sitting with all that. Hey everybody, I'm Cyrus Marcus Ware. Uh, I am, um, how am I? I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm overjoyed by this moment of activism because I feel like activism is life-giving and quite joyful, even when we're in the streets, even when we're raging, even when we're sobbing. Uh, the, the act of activism can be very life-giving for me. So um, so on the one hand, I feel exhausted because uh, as an organizer with Black Lives Matter, Toronto, it's been nonstop. Um, but on the other hand, it's, you know, when we come to the streets, when we uh, resist from our homes, when we say enough is enough, when we say, uh, you know, that Black Lives Matter, when we, when, we, when we do this organizing and fighting, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful, magical thing. And to have, um, human beings coming together and screaming uh, in unison, a chorus uh, of voices standing up for Black lives. That's a beautiful thing. So uh, I'm feeling uh, tired, but energized from this moment. Um, I also have been uh, you know, in, involved in a lot of direct action and there's more to come. There was uh, a police killing here in Toronto that we've been organizing around. And uh, you know, I mean, these are heartbreaking times too. I mean, I, I also, my heart is so full of um, you know, listening to family members, listening to people tell stories about the anti-blackness they experience in their day-to-day -day, day -day life. We've heard a lot of that over the last week and it's heartbreaking. It's so much to hold all of that. Uh, so I'm just sitting here with a lot of complex emotions, but in general, I'm, I'm energized by this conversation being such a public one. And I'm energized by the fact that the conversation has shifted from Band-Aid reform to all out revolution. <laughs> And so I'm here for it. Awesome. Um, so all three of you hinted, um, and I should say y'all are our first sort of um, triad of guests. So moderating is a little different, um, <laughs> but um, you, you hinted at doing different work or your work has shifted a little bit um, during this time. Can you, can you tell us a little bit just basically about what you're doing right now and what your sort of where your focus is and you know, a background bio if, you, if you're interested in doing so? And again, whoever wants to go first can. I feel like y'all are staring each other down. <laughs> I think we're just kind of in awe of each other. I'm like, wow, you're doing it. You're no, doing I'm, it, I'm yeah. just so excited for y'all to, to hear this bit and then just really spend time together and, and sort of fellowship a little bit. I can I can start. I mean, I, I just was speaking. I might as well just keep keep going. But I'll say uh, I'm an I'm an artist and an activist and an organizer. And um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the question. I just totally lost it. We started. It was an I am. You know, what are you work? What are you thinking yeah, on? So um, you know, how you shifted, your work shifted if it shifted at all. Yeah, I mean, my I'm an artist and an activist and an organizer. I'm also just finishing a PhD uh, specifically in prison abolition and disability justice. And um, my uh, work shifted from sort of everyday kind of making art, you know, working on my PhD a little bit and doing some activism to being full on 24 seven, all hours of the day, uh, responding to media requests, responding to the needs of this moment, supporting family members. Like it's just shifted dramatically. And that's what happens when these things kind of ramp up um, is that suddenly the demands become around the clock and there's just so much. So right now my work day shifted from being sort of like a pandemic-ish 11 to seven to now being 24 seven. Um, so that's what I've been working on a lot. We're uh, you know very involved in this conversation around defunding the police and prison abolition and trying to make justice for black people by finally ending this this system of, of, of police violence control that extends from slave labor camps. So we've been really you know engaged in, in this conversation around defunding the police and that's what I'm spending a lot of my day. That's my work right now. But I just say that because I'm, um, you know, I, I'm feeling all that and I'm really thinking about what it means to be a curator right now 
My work is uh, art curation and cultural strategy work and being uh, a body, a person who's in a black body, in a body that identifies as she, as well as they. Um, my work has generally been about research, um, documentation and archiving the stories of black people through organizing work, um, artivism, uh, if you will. And I would say in this shelter in place, in this time of this COVID pandemic, uh, in this time of this uprising, I mean, first of all, my mind has been blown, you know, so quickly into the, the reality that we are living in the, the future that we have been looking forward to if, for some of us, reading about, watching, experiencing through literature, through film, through stories from our grandmothers, all of that, you know, folks who, you know, we always thought, you know, we're not gonna see that in our, our lifetime. And so, you know, I've gone, I think, from being someone who is directly organizing exhibition uh, to someone who did on a platform that um, I'm authoring called Artist as First Responder. And to see our work and to, and to know and to understand that even the people who do not identify as artists are pulling from their most creative divine self to do this work. But that also this destination, this designation, this experience and this platform really pulls the thread on um, amplifying the light and the creative labor that has often gone unspoken, uh, unthanked, unnoticed, um, and putting it right and centering it in the front, putting it right in the front of our face. That is the artist that shows up first. When there's a catastrophe, a situation, any kind of um, idea that is operating the way we are right now in a rupture, like there is an absolute shift that has happened that the artists are the ones who make it right for us and speak for us and redesign and help us reimagine. So what I know is that my work has become um, pushed into the forefront of documenting and amplifying that work right now. Thank you, Esteban. Yeah, I can pick up from there. Um, one of the things I've been noticing especially in the last week is how my my work and the different um, organizations and communities and the different spaces that I occupy are all starting to kind of come together around this. And in so many ways, it's a relief to not have to pivot and be like, now I'm doing policy work. Now I'm doing transformative justice, political education. Um, uh, and now I'm doing uh, work around um, supporting you know, labor organizers, uh, which I mostly do through cooperatives with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Um, but to see all this kind of, uh, all these efforts coalescing, and it becomes easier to just sort of be who I am and draw upon the stuff that I've been working on for a long time um, in community. And I think that if, uh, you know, above all else is what is animating the moment. It's that there's all this stuff that we've just been preparing for like we knew this was coming we knew we knew the contradictions and so it's been really interesting to see people who aren't part of my organizing life um get an opportunity or a window into things that i've been this like breadcrumb trail that i've been leaving for <laughs> years and years and years and i'm like oh look at this uh, toolkit around anti-black racism that my worker cooperative developed three years ago that was just like sitting in the wings. It's been hanging out on our website. Some of you are downloading it, but people who are like, oh, I didn't even know that you guys created that. And and I follow some of what you guys are doing or uh, this book, you know, doing a little show and tell. Um, this book called Beyond Survival that actually just came out earlier this year. Um, it's called, the subtitle is Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement. Um, and it goes back to organizing that I started doing 15 years ago. Uh, with a group called the Philly Stands Up Collective. Um, and we have a couple chapters in here, uh, but it's got contributions from this multiracial, uh, mostly queer uh, movement of, of people who have been experimenting and testing out what a world looks like uh, without prisons, without policing. Um, because that question always needs to be answered. As well. Like it's not just enough to insist upon, hey, we don't like this whole thing with the criminal legal system, but to while knowing that that's going to hit a wall at some point, that it's going to have a, a, a crisis moment, 
you know, what, what are the things that we can propose and, and explore and say that we can recommend or test out? And so this starts to highlight some of those things. It just came out earlier this year. I, I think, you know, in terms of what I'm up to, it is straddling the political education, the resource sharing, um, being a, a, a cheerleader for people who are doing different kinds of organizing and making sure that they're feeling replenished and encouraged, especially for black organizers to share their voice um, and to lift up white people, the white people in multiracial movements who've been instructive, who've been who've actually done their homework, who aren't like, I got woke because I saw a meme, you know, two weeks ago, but who actually are there to be the resource so that my phone isn't blowing up because I've got other <laughs> frontiers to be pushing forward. Um, and I'm like, you know what? Y'all can be connecting with these folks. Um, so kind of making sure that we're connecting those dots is, is, is a, an important piece of the organizing. Yeah. It, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, in particular over this weekend, um, is around just the, the rapid change in being the only person in rooms talking about, like, I grew up in a town without police. And people be like, what, huh? And I'm like, so everybody should do that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah. All over the United States where there actually aren't police, where they straight up, if you have, a, you might have one police officer. Um, I think there were, my township had none. Um, the town itself had like two or three, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And now everyone's talking about it. Um, and what I think is so interesting that you all touched on is this is actually work that folks have been doing for so long. And we're at this, this perfect moment where, you know, white people who have never gone out to a protest think they're are going out to a peaceful protest with their kids and finding themselves being tear gassed. Yeah. Which immediately debunks the idea that black people do something to deserve policing. Um, and then there's this whole, I mean, you can immediately quickly plug into either Twitter threads or resources that, that movement um, workers have been have been building up over decades to academic journals. There's a whole just breadth of academic research. And I mean, it just seems like this watershed moment in terms of being able to rapidly radicalize a white population about, which is just crazy to me. Yeah, this is such an interesting time. And I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I similarly, I, I, I've been a prison abolitionist for 25 years. I've been literally working on the ground doing abolition work for 25 years. And now to see articles in Cosmo about defunding the police right? and about prison abolition, I'm like, I wake up sometimes and I don't quite know what world I've woken up into, <laughs> except that I know that I think I like it. <laughs> so yeah, just sort of thinking about what it means right now for this to be the zeitgeist, for this to be the push yeah. that we're all sort of talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ruth um, Wilmore, w Wilson Gilmore uh, talks about, and, and you know, Julia Sudbury, Chinere Apara, you know, so many scholars have talked about how the abolition of the police and prison system is just the finishing the work of our ancestors mm -hmm. that right. abolished slavery. This is just a continuation of that work. You know, Che Gossett um, made this beautiful tweet yesterday that said, yes, pull down all of the monuments to slavery, starting with police and prisons. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. recognize that yes. those are monuments to slavery. Yes. Uh, you know, and so I'm really interested in how this is being taken up. What I think about as an activist, of course, is that we know our messaging can be co-opted. We know our messaging can be watered down. We know our messaging can be shifted. So what I don't want to see is a reduction of the police budget by 10%, for example, and then mm. consider it done. That is not what we are fighting for. If we are in the streets right now in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a pandemic, we are going to fight for the entire percentage, 100% of that mm -hmm. budget. Right. We're going to make sure... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to make sure that Black people are able to be in the streets and be free. I mean, when we look at what's happening, Black people, and in particular Black mad people, are just not safe in the streets because of policing. This is a system that is not working. It is not keeping our community safer and more secure. It is not creating a sense of justice for a whole bunch of people. It's instead brutalizing particular communities. And so the only way to, to live on this planet at this moment with any human dignity at the moment is to struggle against these systems of violence that are brutalizing black and indigenous communities in particular ways. Um, so I'm I'm here for this conversation. I'm here for this moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sort of, you know, watching and, and seeing it unfold while also trying to push to make sure that it doesn't get watered down. Right. Yeah. I think one of the dangers of 
that I'm noticing that I started seeing in real time last week over social media, primarily around that watering down, mm -hmm. is around holding up on the one hand, the most extreme uh, manifestation of these systems that that's very visible and that's very front of mind. And uh, a tendency, particularly from white voices to reduce things and say, all we're asking for is to just stop murdering black people. And it's like, mm -hmm. y'all, there is a whole system. There's a whole apparatus behind that. And like, this is what's happening on camera. Of course it's egregious mm -hmm. that they're arresting CNN correspondents on live television for all the suburban moms to see. But that is not all we're asking for. And so holding the line and making sure that the very people who are outraged about that, that we're bringing them along, that we're not necessarily alienating them, but that we're continuing to do the political education to say, no, it's actually not enough to just like have the police be gentler or to shrink their budgets a little. I mean, their budgets have tripled mm -hmm. just in the last decade. So even a reduction of, you know, 75% is not adequate. What we need to talk about is the, the more fundamental um, structures of what is powering the system, what, yes. what are our models of justice? And so to make sure that every time that we're saying, actually it's about abolition, that, that that every day that gets decentered. It's almost like mindfulness meditation. It's like, we're like, no, this thing. And they're like, totally, totally. And then the world starts drifting off. We're like, no, 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 no. Come back, this thing, this is our intention. Please return to it. And here's also why. Here are some mm -hmm. of the things mm -hmm. you can understand about why um, you know, more surveillance and body cameras and larger budgets or whatever is not the solution and is not what's working. And it's also not about how we shrink a carceral system or how we make it friendlier or gentler that actually the, from, from the, uh, the roots of the system itself, it is all messed up. And in fact, um, the, the criminalization of black bodies has everything to do with, with our economic system. That's and right. the fact that black people don't have wealth, don't have means, and this pandemic has only heightened the desperation of that. Mm -hmm. So this, this can't be reduced to just being about the most egregious thing that you saw that woke you out of your stupor of being comfortable with a white mm -hmm. supremacist system. Mm -hmm needs to be about actually reckoning with what is going on with black people. There is not going back to normal. Normal was dispossessing black and indigenous people uh, for centuries. And so what we need to do is come out of this, reorganizing a lot of things. And I th I'm so here for that journey. I'm mm -hmm. not here to help educate white ladies about how to conduct themselves in their nonprofits in a particular way. <laughs> Ooh, say here, that, friend, say it. <laughs> what it looks like. Come on. To, to some like I'm core so fundamental <laughs> transform our system. And I, I will have those conversations with white people. Totally, I'm here for that. <laughs> Ooh, I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm here for you, I'm here for you. You know, uh, there's a, there's a, a meme going around, you know, defund the police as a strategy, uh, abolish the police as a goal, and fuck the police as an attitude. <laughs> and I, that really, okay, I resonate with that. That, Could that you works say that for again? Me. Could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> defund the police as a strategy, abolish the police is the goal, and fuck the police is an attitude. It's the <laughs> attitude. So that's, that's what we're thinking about. That's what we're moving through. You know, my, my comrade in... Uh, New Zealand, Sonia Renee Taylor, brilliant uh, artist, poet, and author, was uh, on her on her IG the other day, you know, just talking about the slumber of white folks, you know, and that your slumber is not free. It came at the cost of black lives. And that's the truth. It's like, you know, what you're saying is like, really like, okay, y'all got here and now you want us to be embraced. And it's like, they're going out to some activity that you said, take your babies to it and mm -hmm. let's go and like raise our fist and, and they're not, um, able to really kind of like understand the intersectional oppressions and the systems that are interpersonal, intergenerational, um, internal, you know, all of these things are like at play. And it, it's really, it's a trip. It's a trip. And, you know, and my work is really about bringing back to the center, the, the lives, the creative uh, labor of black women specifically. And, you know, who is at the center of queer women who is at the center, whose ideas and work is like fueling this and continuing to keep us afloat. You know, we're able to be buoyant and like take a rest and come back because black women are always working. Yeah. You know, as I said, mama's always on stage, that old Arrest Arrested Development joint. And it's like on all of the time, you know? And so there's, there's there has to be um, an honoring of that. And there has to be, you know, something in terms of like creative labor and artistic labor 
that centers our stories, Black people telling our stories. And you know, one of the situations that's unfolded here in the Bay Area, maybe some other places as well, is uh, white white artists, white creative collectives getting paid money to write Black Lives Matter, to like, you know, to actually put black bodied art on all of the boarded up windows in downtown Oakland. I see you like holding your face because it's like really something to behold over the weekend. One of the things that happened is that downtown, the, the strip in downtown Broadway on in Oakland became a walking gallery. It's kind of glorious, but you see a lot of white artists outside. And you know you have organizations and artists who you know went to those organizations and said, hey, you know, can I get some money to to do some art, to do some mural art? And they're putting up you know flowers and fairies and gnomes, and it's like, no, this is an opportunity. This is you must center the radical imagination of Black lives right now. And so you being up here with like one brown body and 22 white folks. You know, Peyton, so that, you know, there's a sister uh, who has been championing this uh, over the weekend uh, named Sequoia. And um, it's, I'll have to find her Instagram so that we can share it uh, in, the, in the chat. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're looking at this called Paint the Void, this organization Paint the Void, as though there was some void here in the Bay Area or United States. There's no void in our communities. Our communities are vibrant and rich and like centering our creative labor. And so this idea of like, let's just paint over and be like, you know, we just, we just want y'all to stop killing black people. It's like, there is a conversation that has to happen, happen around power and privilege and fear and rage and what that means for all of us who have some modicum of privilege, even being able to sit on uh, in front of a screen for an hour and talk about this. Mm -hmm. What are we willing to give up? What does that mean to actually decentralize the power? And what does it mean to be in revolution? You know, not actually white culture, mainstream capitalist, you know, uh, extractive culture in, in the sense that, oh, that's the dream, but actually not have that in blackface, but to actually have a true revolution. You know, so what does that mean for us to like make it plain and lay it bare? Because it's been laid bare. It's been laid bare. Yeah, I think. Um... All of y'all are touching on this sort of um, between the watering down and and movements being co-opted. Um, just this, how easy it is for a general population to drift away from a mission. Like it's like, ooh, shiny thing over there, and and sometimes the calls coming from inside the house. So can we can we talk about it? Can't wait. Um, can yeah, we? we can. Yeah. Can we can we explain um, the the problems inherent in that proposal that's being put forth, which is, you know, seems at its face to, to not be diametrically opposed to, I think what all of us are aligned with, which is prison abolition and, and police, that police abolition work. Yeah, uh, so I'll, maybe I'll start with just a tiny piece of that, which is one, um, I think that part of what is important about the role of artists uh, organizers, poets, creative people is making sure, and it's not like your responsibility if you're a creative, do your thing, like that's your role as an artist. <laughs> it's not, you're not charged um, with doing this. But I think what it helps us do is pop open our capacity to expand and imagine so that when, when my folks are proposing these like, whoa, mind blowing things, ideas like that we can decenter white supremacy, that we can live in a world without prisons, that workers can own um, their own jobs and workplaces, um, that, that all different bodies, body types um, can be liberated, that disability justice can be at the centers of how we re, uh, reconstruct our society, that that all has a place to land, that it's like tilling the soil so that when, that, when those seeds sprinkle in and land, all we're waiting for is for that nice little rain to come in and be the thing that helps to uh, catalyze the growth of those seeds, right? And so mm -hmm. artists help help to make that that case, including within our own communities, mm -hmm. including for right. um, our, our for Black people who have internalized a lot of as a survival strategy. Like there mm -hmm. was no way, there's no way to get through your day to day without being like, what are my strategies to just get through and to get by? Yeah. And some of that needs to be having some sort of faith in the education system as it is, in um, our public spaces as they are, mm -hmm. um, and all the different forms of even, you know, at least in the US, um, 
a lot of elected democratic um, officials uh, under whose watch this is all happening, right? This is happening in places like Los Angeles, Minneapolis, New York, Philadelphia. Um, so don't try to turn this into a Trump thing or a red state thing like that. This so all of those things need to be um, need to be uh, taken into consideration when we're strategizing not just about who we're calling in in a multiracial movement, but how internal to ourselves. I mean, we have to do this work for each other even within mm -hmm. movements. That's what accountability is, is being accountable to our ancestors and, sure. um, and finishing that work, as you were saying, that, that Dr. Gilmore um, uh, pushes us um, in some of the most, I think, powerful ways to insist upon. Like, we're not just saying, you know what, uh, a world without prisons because of minor drug offenses and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> Ruth Gil uh, Wilson Gilmore, it insists upon us saying that we got to start with rapists and murders and, and think about what are our strategies for solving those problems around mm -hmm. domestic violence. I mean, a lot of my work um, in this area comes from working with sexual assault situations within my community without in any way relying on courts, police and systems um, and, and kind of experimenting with community accountability. So I think that's part of what uh, artists uh, are able to do is to keep us open um, to, that, to that world of possibilities. And then I think we then train that on these moments where uh, some reformist moves start to come, because of course they're gonna come. Someone always wants to say what is quick and easy. And then there's, there's when you have mass mo global mobilizations, we're all conditioned to have something that's cathartic, something that feels good, that feels like a win. And I think that's an important lesson to our movements. Are we, are we setting people up to feel disappointed because the thing that we're telling everyone we're fighting for is so um, unattainable and therefore everyone is right to be scooped up into, hey, we painted Black Lives Matter on the street, and like, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. so like we're all we're all good now. And so, actually, training people, whether it's in, uh, Instagram influencers um, or well-meaning uh, multiracial people, um, training them that we need to listen to the right voices. That we can't be tokenizing just any black people. We can't be tokenizing um, any uh, any political platform. That um, that seems like it's it's um, it's it's achievable and a win, therefore. Um, but that we actually need to. Uh, in fact, this past weekend, the 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 statement that I made on Instagram that I think was like reposted the most, um, especially from white people, was one where I was saying, "Listen, you're not going to know. Something's going to feel cathartic in your body, and you're going to be like, great, this thing feels great. I see a cop kneeling or whatever. You're not going to know what black liberation looks like." So just trust, retrain mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. to start listening to us mm -hmm. and not in a tokenizing way, start listening to movement leaders who've been doing this work and this organizing for decades. We will tell you, trust that we will tell you, we will tell you when things um, are helpful and are winning. What's happening in Minneapolis with their city council saying, actually, we've we've done a full hard look at reassessing mm -hmm. all different reformist, eight can't wait style policies. And we're like, no, the only way to actually do this is to defund the police. That is really helpful and important. And when we look at cities that have, you know, three out of four, six out of eight of the uh, of those platforms that have been put forward um, from the "It Can't Wait" campaign, um, and still uh, extreme police brutality and impunity from police unions, especially, um, allows for uh, the murder um, and uh, and the violation of uh, of of. Um, the rights and uh, and the bodies of black people in those communities, then we know that that's not what's going to get us free. That it needs mm -hmm. to be, you know, that it that it needs to be something that is more uh, fundamental. I've been really, I'm so picking up what you're putting down. I mean, I've been really moved by that Tony K. Bambara quote that the role of the artist from an oppressed community is yes. to make revolution irresistible, like to literally make revolution irresistible. And that's, you know, I'm an artist, and you know, that's been my driving goal is how do we use our creative practice to make revolution irresistible? And I think that what that's what we're seeing, you know, we're still seeing some creative activisms right now that are helping us. I think as you say, like it helps to break down a very complex idea into a digestible format because people are able to take it in in a different way through an artistic medium, you know? And so I'm very, very interested in that in that action of making revolution irresistible. And I think that right now what we're seeing you know, you need to take leadership from, I mean, just turn to any of this. There are incredible black artists who are making 
you know, work. When we think of the work of Emery Douglas and what he was doing for the Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. you know, as the revolutionary artist for the movement, you know, he was putting out work weekly, daily, you know, posting it in the streets, you know, trying to address the social issues that were happening to people in their communities. And I think we're seeing artists doing that now, you know, creating a, a massive amount of things, even yes, painting on the streets as a creative activism, you know, it's That's a, right. a way of sharing a message in a way that other people, rather than giving a lecture or, or, or hosting another webinar, it's, it's a direct way to do it. So I'm very, very interested in, in the, in the activism art that's coming out of this movement and this moment. You know, when we think about um, abolition, I think it's so important to recognize, yes, I think you, 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 you touched on that, that there, there are, there are literally ancestors, generations that have been working towards abolition. So we need not reinvent the wheel. We need, we don't need white people to claw this and, and to say, here's what we need to do. We've already laid the foundations. And you turn to the amazing and incredible work of, again, Dr. G Dr. Uh, Gilmore, you know, Chinire Apara, Amona Ozakara Ray, uh, the amazing work of Vivian Salahana and Giselle Diaz coming out of uh, Canada. You know, there's incredible writing and art and music mm -hmm. and, and stuff about abolition that we can turn to right now. Mm -hmm. uh, artists have been, sh have been monumental and influential in shaping this movement for decades. And so we need just to turn to them and say, hey, you know, mm -hmm. what, what are we, how do we amplify your, your message right now? That's right. I mean, it's listen to artists. There isn't any movement on the planet that hasn't been led and fueled by artists. There is always going to be a chant, a song, a movement piece. There is going to be a poem. That's that is how we move, and it's how we remember ourselves. Our humanity starts in that place. We all come out as artists. Any child who can feel a vision will dance to it before they can walk. Any child who can uh, make sound will sing before they can like form sentences and speak and communicate. So we all come out this way. You know what I'm saying? And this 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 whole idea that, oh, now let's be artistic and, and cool and let's all learn how to make murals and do art. It's like, that's good. That's good. And, you know, there's actual strategy behind that. There's actual process behind that. It's not like, oh, I'm feeling like, you know, really angry. I'm going to go, you know, paint up the wall or tag the wall. I mean, there is actual strategy to graffiti art. You know what I'm saying? So there's, uh, I'm, as you say, I'm picking up what you're putting down and appreciating that. And, you know, you calling the names of the organizers, Dr. Gilmore, uh, Dr. Opara, you know, folks here in the Bay Area, shout out to Chenere, who's, you know, um, provost here at Mills College in, in uh, East Oakland. Um, you know, but also a shout out to the revolutionary artists. You, you mentioned uh, our beloved Baba Emery Douglas, but also uh, Joan Tarika Lewis, who is the first artist of the Black Panther Party, a black woman who was, um, whose work was not co-opted and not uh, amplified in the way in which Emery's uh, work was, but that she is still alive and living and is also a musician and like put down her, her instrument and picked up a pen and picked up a paintbrush and picked up you know, that's work and then put it back down so that she could like be on the front lines of the revolution with the other women who were leading the Black Panther Party. And, uh, you know, this legacy that we have that they laid out for us of love, of radical revolutionary love and how to take care of each other, how to take care of ourselves throughout uh, the communities, throughout the United States and throughout the world. You know, that those, those models are, are what we're picking up right now. So just just want to want to honor her work um, and honor the work. You know, see black women, protect black women, trust black women, hear black women, and pay black women. And I, I don't want us to like lose you know this opportunity to really center the economic implications of being a cultural worker and being an, uh, an artist. And sometimes they are not the same thing. But that right now there is an opportunity for those of us who. Um, who are cultural workers and who are cultural ac activists and organizers to actually be able to participate at a, at a very high level in the economic security and sustainability of our communities and of this movement. There isn't any movement that happens mm -hmm. on this planet without money. So mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. to be part of this conversation as well. And the Compahee River Collective, you know, in the yes, 1970s, yes. they were saying, they said, if we make the world safer for Black women, we are necessarily making the world safer for everybody. I would expand that to a 2020 imagining and say, if we make the world safer for Black trans women with disabilities, whoo, mm. honey, this world would look radically, radically different if, if the world was actually safe for those people. So, yes, thank you so much for bringing in, you know, the, like the incredible amount of 
edgy, uh, underfunded, unfunded labor of Black women mm -hmm. in this movement and this organizing for decades. Thank you. I think um, my last question before we land the plane is, um, we've talked about a bit about sustainability and movement work, like long, um, you know, how do we sustain ourselves to do this work? Um, and as I said earlier, the thing that, that has been front of my mind all weekend is how long people have been doing this work. How do we sustain people's activism over a long, hot summer into a fall election in the States anyway, without having them get distracted? What are, what are some concrete strategies that we can use? Um, because that's, that's something that's been top of my mind. So much of my artistic practice is about sustainability of activist lives. I write uh, love letters to activists. I draw giant portraits of activists. I do things to try to help make sure that they can continue the work. One of the things I would say as an artist, but also as an activist who's been on the front lines is we need to be remember that we need breaks. We need, we need lots of breaks. I've been following the Nat Ministry, you know, that black uh, account on Instagram that you know, reminds us yes. that black naps are part of our reparations, that are part of our, our, our justice that's due to us. So making sure that activists are taking time for, for breaks and for rejuvenation, taking, you know, having people that they can check in with on a regular basis, maybe a weekly basis, maybe a standing call where you can just be like, oh, by the way, here, this is what happened this week. This is what I need to process. This is what I need to engage with, you know, making sure that they have support supports around them to be able to continue doing the work. There's an activist here in, in Toronto named Tucker Gomberg who passed away, who, who just before he did wrote an open letter to all activists. And in it, he says, you have to build up networks of care and support while you're well around your activism so that then if things get too much, if you start to get pulled down, you have supports ready to help you when you in that moment. So take care of yourself, take care of yourself. We take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also recognizing that, um, you know, there's a diversity of tactics and there are certain tactics that are more sustainable or easier to sustain than others. It is very difficult to sustain tens of thousands of people on the street all summer long, year after year. Mm -hmm. Yes, we know that we're in crisis. We know that uh, our movements will call for that level um, of, of turnout and much more frequently than than in recent US history. Um, so that's that's good. We, we do need mo moments of that. But in between, uh, first of all, it, on an individual level, assess where you're at and sit it out if you need to sit it out, right? Um, but but in between, it's very it's actually really easy to sustain things like political education. It's really easy to stay plugged into uh, listening to uh, to black leadership and black voices to educate yourself. There's reading lists all over the place, especially nowadays, um, and and even for for people who have the, the privilege of being able to work remotely um, or to be part of workplaces where that they can return to safely with PPE. Um, uh, some of what we've done at um, at Aorta, my my worker co-op that does political education and, and training, um, are around toolkits um, and trainings and curriculum for designing sustainable workplaces so that it is not one set of work to create a just feminist um, work <laughs> environment with workplace democracy and a separate set of work to work on your mission. You can bring those things together. The work itself should not be draining and you don't need to figure it out all on your own. Like that's, <laughs> that's there and it includes things like, here are some uh, suggested readings for uh, non-black people of color to be in solidarity and to be engaging with movements, or you can always learn about history. I'm constantly having my mind blown about just recovering our own political histories that, that have been lost to me because of the cultural particularity of being uh, a historical in the United States all the time and just being like, reconstruction, what? Or like the, the civil rights movement in the 20s and 30s did what? Like Ella Baker, what? So these are these. There is um. There is a lot. Just find whatever you're passionate about. There's something that that will not be boring to you, particularly, but that is still an important contribution in your own consciousness elevation in in, in the movement. And I think that that's something that we can do to sustain ourselves um, in between these moments of things popping off. Yeah, and I I would add um, some of the sustaining work that has been going on is around relational aid and also called mutual aid. And I believe that that is something that we can continue to do in different ways for each other. We take care of each other as, as we've all you know, uh, said. And it's, 
I've had the experience um, as, a, as a cultural worker who works as a consultant most of the time. I've had the, the gift of other artists, actually of other black women artists saying, hey, I sold a piece of art and um, I got a check. And so if I have money, then you have money as a curator, you know, because you create space, that's your superpower. And we are relational in how we sustain our, our financial well-being. yes. And so taking care of each other, when you see somebody put up their cash app or their PayPal or whatever, cash them out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. It can be a little bit of money. It's like, hey, you know, I got a hundred bucks. I can give you 10, you know, maybe that 10 will buy you a meal that week. So, you know, I mean, thinking about um, how to share our resources that are financial as well as, you know, when we, if you have a circle of folks that you can touch, maybe you all give each other foot rubs, mm -hmm. you, know? <laughs> and, you know, maybe you just like, Ping your, your homie, your comrade and say, hey, you know, did you take a nap today? You know, can I bring you some uh, greens from my box garden outside my window? What, what can mm -hmm. I do? So those kind of things I think helps to sustain our humanity with each other. And, but it's, it's really about showing love to one another, you know, showing each other that we care, that we're listening deeply and that, you know, small is all, you know, mm -hmm. as our comrade Adrienne Marie Brown, you know, has, gifted us with, uh, you know, a set of emergent strategies and that, you know, remembering that everything does not have to be big and grandiose. It doesn't have to be, you know, a giant mural on the street. It might just be a little, you know, a little tag on the bus stop that I saw walking by on my way with my fist in the air and my sign in the hand, you know, and I have the, I have the opportunity to, to notice those small things and see beauty, beauty, and to be able to like remember that there is joy and pleasure that is also necessary and part of this movement making, part of this revolutionary body, you know, part of us, us understanding and knowing each other, that joy has to be part of this movement. Yeah. A minute. Oh, that, that was beautiful. Um, yeah. So I, I think yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna close on that. Um, yeah. That was just really, thank you. Thank all of you for your yes. time today. Um, yeah. Tim, you have anything to add? I'm glad you're still here. I've been worried about that. He's just like silent over there. I'm like, yo. <laughs> this, I, I, I do not have the ability to put together words uh, to say thank you enough uh, for being able to uh, be here for this conversation. Um, Ashara, Esteban, and, and Cyrus, really sincerely, thank you so much for, for being a part of uh, this special conversation uh, with us. And um yeah, I'm just gonna say yeah. say say thank you. Uh, we'll put you into the green room for just a second. If you can hang out right right there, um, but uh, yeah, th thanks so much, and see you in just a second. Yeah, Tim, you're rendered speechless. Yeah, um, there's you got so some, much. Got I, some I, good I, notes. I've got a lot of notes. <laughs> I have a lot. Oh, you taking notes? <laughs> I know. I've, I've, like, part, Partly it's also like, let's just get the transcript because there's more things that I need to, to go back to. Um, so the transcript will be, be ready in a couple of days. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of notes I, and um, stuff that I'll be, be looking at meditating on um, today and in the, in the coming days and in weeks. So um, this has been, been fun getting the band back together again. Yeah, uh, it's been really good. Yeah. I, I do yeah. hope that there's not something else that bubbles up. So we have to do this again. <laughs> It's sort of on yeah. the fly. Like I, I just, I'm, I don't want to have to sort of, I don't know. We're, we're yeah. continually pivoting. So I, I need, I need us to have, to find some sustainability in, in this movement and to find our own individual ways to continue plugging in as best we can. Yeah. Well, this episode will be available uh, in, in audio only podcast transcript captioned as well as our, our one that we had on Friday. Uh, that'll all be there to, to go with the 25 episodes from season one. Um, it's been fun uh, doing this again with you, Lauren. Uh, Same. I've missed it uh, part of my morning. Um, but uh, with that, thank you. Thanks to our guest. And thanks to everyone who's, who's been here watching and listening. Uh, we'll see you next time.